Good morning. Um, I apologize for starting right on time, but um, we have a meeting that's starting at 8.30 over in Building 31, which is the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, and I am the chair of that, and so um, I have to be out of here and over there as expeditiously as possible. Um, but I didn't want to not share with you information about the current state of the NIH Brain Initiative. Um, this is a slide that I don't think will surprise anybody. If you look at the leading categories of um, disability, this is from 2010. Um, neuropsychiatric disorders beat out, if you can call it a win, cardiovascular, cancer, musculoskeletal disorders in the U.S. in terms of disability. Um, if you look at um, mental and behavioral disorders, these are um, the most disabling disorders before age 50. Tom Insel, who is the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health, has made it very clear that um, most psychiatric disorders are developmental disorders, schizophrenia, changes that happen in wiring in the brain um, during adolescence are then uh, seen as schizophrenia. So. Mental illness, mental and behavioral disorders are the most disabling before age 50. And every one of us over age 50 um, has concerns about um, neurodegenerative diseases. And this is a slide that shows you um, the evidence of what it's going to cost us in this country if we don't figure out a way to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. The light bars are the cost um, of caring for people with Alzheimer's, and the dark bars are what could happen if, in fact, we were able to slow um, the progression or delay the onset by five years. So it's very clear um, that the challenge for the 21st century, which is where we are, is not um, infectious diseases, although those of us who've been watching the news about Ebola in Africa Maybe that's not 100% um, true. It's, in fact, chronic non-communicable diseases, mental illness, neurodegenerative diseases, um, other neurological disorders that are really going to be, in the 21st century, what infectious, infectious diseases were in the 20th century. And um, brain disorders, neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative, um, addiction, will be the most disabling and most costly these chronic diseases, more costly than cardiovascular problems, than heart problems, than kidney problems, than diabetes. Um, the problem is, and I think most of us recognize this, that we simply don't know enough about the brain to meet this challenge. We, we have some idea of the anatomy, we have some idea of the circuitry, but if you think about most mental illnesses, we believe now that they are circuit disorders where the wiring isn't quite right. Well, we don't know the wiring in enough detail. We don't know how the wiring gets set up, and we don't know how to fix it. So um, how do we learn more about the brain? So Tom, again, um, has this wonderful slide with a quote. Um, that makes the argument that scientific progress really comes from the development of new tools and technologies that allow us to see things or understand things that we didn't see before. And if you compare Galileo's telescope with the Hubble, it's clear that having um, the wonderful new telescopes that have developed over hundreds of years, that a better telescope lets you see more. And, and we believe that if we had better tools and technologies to study the brain, we would be able to learn more, which would in turn enable us to address um, brain disorders. And I'm going to give you some examples of some wonderful tools that have actually been developed over the past decade. Um, this particular slide shows you um, Brainbow, this is a, a technique that was developed by um, Jeff Lickman and Josh Sainz at Harvard University. And what you can see is that this technique gives you a different color in all the different neurons. And by putting a different color, a fluorescent dye, in all the different neurons, you can actually see the axons of individual neurons and the connections they make in this particular case in neuromuscular junctions. 
Um, another tool, and this is one that was just developed by Carl Dyseroth at Stanford, turns um, brains of mice and rats and even parts of human brains absolutely clear. So here you can see um, the brain of a mouse sitting on some words. Um, after doing the clarity process, this brain becomes completely transparent. And this shows you that you can actually see through it. And here is a photomicrograph of the fluorescent dyes that, have, that are present in those cells. And if you, um, if we could run this movie, I'd be able to show you this image of uh, a slice of mouse brain that is completely transparent and you can dive into that slice and see individual cells and their processes. And this may seem trivial to you, but I can tell you that investigators in trying to sort out how different parts of the brain are connected using special dyes and tracing techniques in order to look at the whole brain have had to cut hundreds of thin sections and then use computational tools to reconstruct the brain. Well, here you don't need to do any of that. You've got the whole brain with all the connectivity there and you just work your way to see what the connections are. Um, it's also possible not just to see the, like the road map, the static connectivity, but also to watch neurons in action. And this is a wonderful um, device. It's called an endoscope. And here you can see it on um, someone's finger, developed by Mark Schnitzer. And this actually gets implanted in a mouse brain. And what you can do after you've implanted it, you can look at the firing pattern, um, the neurons within that part of the brain as, um, for example, a mouse is doing a task. And in the middle of this maze, this radial arm maze, is a mouse. And what the mouse is going to do is to run back and forth each of these arms. And as it runs back and forth, the activity, um, the, the activity calcium spikes in each of the neurons in this area that they're viewing will light up when that neuron fires. And so you can see, in a sense, what the mouse is thinking and remembering as he goes from one part of the maze to the other. And doing this, um, investigators have learned, we used to think that the play cells that help the mouse know where he is or she is in space um, were static. And they kept that notion of what space, what particular space the mouse was in forever. But it turns out that's not true. Those space cells, play cells, actually acquire a, a site and then over time lose the site. But enough of them have some memory that the mouse can tell, you know, if not, they don't obviously in the wild run on a maze, but where they buried the, the corn. Um, even more important, so that's a correlation. The cell lights up when the mouse is here, but now we can even control the firing of nerve cells and influence behavior. And this is done by putting a, a channel rhodopsin genetically into the cells. These are all animal experiments into cells and then using light to activate those cells. And here's a rat with um, a small laser guide that's been implanted. And in this particular study, they have, they have learned which cells actually are responsible for remembering a fear response. So um, you train the mouse to be afraid of a particular part of the cage. And then you take him out of that cage and you, you um, actually stimulate the cells you believe are responsible <coughs> with this laser light and the mice, mouse cowers. So he's not in the fearful part of the cage. You've actually elicited that behavior by stimulating a subset of neurons. So you're now able to connect particular sets of neurons and particular circuits with mediating in, in new behaviors. And I can tell you this has revolutionized our ability to understand causality in, in behavioral responses. Um, this actually got the best advance of the year award um, and, uh, for um, Carl Dyseroth. And the last advance that we have um, that I want to talk about is 
the Human Connectome Project. And what's being done here is fantastic imaging studies of 1,200 people, all the circuitry, structural connectivity, um, functional imaging, temporal <coughs> connectivity, some molecular imaging. And this is being done um, right now as we speak at Washington University and the University of Minnesota and Massachusetts General Hospital. And um, these data from the data from these 1,200 people is publicly is going to be all publicly available. So any person anywhere, a graduate student working in Kansas, could go get these data and and really begin to do very interesting and important studies on on the on the human connectome. So these are tools we have at hand. It's been a fantastic decade. We've made wonderful advances. But we still don't know enough to answer the questions that we want. What these advances tell us is that this area is ripe for an explosion in new knowledge. And that um, ripeness, if you will, was recognized by President Obama. Um, and so he actually um, started the next great American project, which is the Brain Initiative. He announced this on April 2nd in the White House um, in 2013. I was there. I have to say it was an amazing experience that this country, this present, recognized brain sciences as the most important scientific area that this country could focus on. And there's this wonderful quote about giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action. And that knowledge will be transformative. So um, the Brain Initiative is a public-private partnership. It includes the National Institutes of Health, DARPA, NSF, and most recently the FDA as federal agencies. But it also includes a whole series of private foundations which are making significant investments in areas that they have defined but are clearly related to the brain initiative. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Allen Bray Institute, Hadley Foundation, Simons Foundation, and there are others which are now beginning to sign up. And I would say it's not just the US government, but the European Union has a project, Australia may have a project, Japan, China. So it's as if the whole world has said, this is what we need to understand and learn more about right now. Um, now, a very interesting fact is that when the president announced this brain initiative, the NIH did not actually have a plan in hand for how we would implement it. So Francis Collins, the director of NIH, put together a group of scientists um, initially called the brain team. Um, but then it, um, they sort of made it the working group of the advisory committee to the director to actually come up with a, a 10 year, it turns out it's a 12 year plan for how we would um, actually learn how the brain works, how it works at the speed of thought, how we think, how we remember, how we see, how we feel. Um, and that group um, had a preliminary report, but in June it released the final report. Uh, on brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies. And um, June 5th, and the advisory committee, the director endorsed it, and Francis accepted it. And, and so the project now has a plan for the next actually 12 years, not 10 years. Um, and it, you know, neuroscience, everybody in here knows this. Neuroscience is a very, very broad area. It includes. Um, understanding the genes that are active in the brain, understanding the genes that cause disease, understanding all kinds of things. But the piece that is um, the focus of the brain initiative is actually circuits and networks. How the 86 trillion billion neurons in the brain are connected up into circuits and how those circuits function. Because um, while we've made advances in a number of other, other areas, this has been a place where um, progress has been slower. So generally, it, the goal is to map the circuits of the brain, if, brains of experimental animals and humans, measure the fluctuating pack, patterns of electrical and chemical activity within these circuits, 
and understand how their interplay creates our unique cognitive and behavioral capabilities. Very, very ambitious. So the um, team actually identified six high priority research areas. Um, the first is sort of like a parts list. How many different kinds of cells are there in the brain? You're never going to understand how the brain works if you don't have the parts list. Secondly, um, figuring out how all the parts are connected. This is the static map, and I've shown you some of the kinds of things we're doing with that now. So generating circuit diagrams. Um, and those circuit diagrams probably are going to vary from individual connections between neurons to um, the kinds of MRI studies that show that the frontal cortex is connected to the lateral cortex, to the posterior cortex. And then um, the brain in action. Not enough to have a map, like a map. What you need to know is how all those parts are actually working together or not. And to do that, we need to have better methods for understanding neural activity. And we need to be able to demonstrate causality. So I told you about opti optogenetics. We, we can now pin on a particular set of neurons responsibility for initiating a particular action or feeling. So we need to be able to demonstrate that kind of causality. And um, we need to be able to take the data and turn it into models and use computational and neuroscience and statistics to actually get um, models that explain how things work. And a lot of this is going to happen in experimental animals, but the end goal is human neuroscience. Um, I think Kurt said yesterday we can cure diseases in mice, but we're really interested in curing diseases in humans. Um, here we'll use the experimental animals to develop tools and principles, but ultimately the goal is to understand how the human, human brain works. <laughs> and Many of the tools that are now being used are not applicable in people. We're not going to put laser guides in to stimulate sets of, of neurons. So we need to figure out how to get tools that we can use in people that give us the same kinds of answers but are ethically um, appropriate. And then um, from the brain initiative to the brain. So all that needs to be integrated and actually help us understand how we think, feel, perceive, and act. Um, so all that's in this um, wonderful document. I've read it five times and um, can keep reading it. And every time I read it, I learn something more. It's on the website. There's a very wonderful executive summary. And some of the language in this literally sings. Um, incredibly well written. And they divided the. Um, 10 years, which is really 12 years, into an initial part which emphasizes technology development and a second part which emphasizes discovery-driven science. But both things will go on throughout this period. Now, the thing that they were forced to do, which they resisted doing, was to actually come up with an estimated budget. I'm sure all of you know everybody who is arguing or proposing a particular activity wants there to be numbers that are the dollars that are required. So they came up with um, an estimated budget. And you can see here this is the development of neurotechnology over time. And we're in FY14, about to go into FY15. Um, this is the neuroscience piece, taking those new tools and technologies and using them to understand brain function. Um, there's infrastructure because um, we want everyone who, who is studying important questions in brain function to actually have access to these technologies. And when you add it all up, um, it ramps up. This is a request, an estimate. This is not guaranteed money. It, it ramps up to $400 million per year by 2018, plateaus at $500 million. And it's a total investment of $4.5 by FY 2025. But if you think about the burden of brain disorders and the need to have these, this understanding and these tools and technologies, um, I think it makes economic sense. 
So just to summarize, and I apologize for those who of you who have come a little late, that we're already at the summary. Um, brain disorders are the leading source of disease burden and cost in the US. Recent breakthroughs, and I gave you a few examples of those, even though the movies didn't work, are transforming how we can study brain structure and function. But the best is yet to come. The Brain Initiative will build on this recent progress to create tools that will accelerate discovery and build the foundation we need to reduce the burden of brain disorders. Now, um, the first grants will be released, announced um, next week. It's $46 million um, in FY14 that was put aside by a number of institutes and was given to some institutes in their budgets to really launch this. I mean, we've been launching it kind of with the plan, but now these will be actual studies going on in 58 labs across the country, a couple labs overseas, that will make this not just um, a goal, but uh, um, a reality. A, a, um, a kind of secondary um, thing that happened because of the president's um, announcement is that all of a sudden the brain has become or became the next big thing. So here is the cover from Science News Magazine. Here's the cover from Scientific American. And here's the cover from National Geographic. And these three covers and <coughs> wonderful text in each of those um, came out over a course of three months. Now, um, the, the, um, it's died down a bit. Um, but we are hoping that with the release of these grants um, and the publicity that should attend that, that there will be a new wave of interest. And for anyone who, who has a brain disorder or who knows someone who does, family, friends, this kind of attention on the importance of the brain and understanding the brain should be extraordinarily welcome. Because um, if you can convince, educate the public about the brain, what it does, and the disabling disorders, I think we'll all be in a much better place to learn to treat them. Now, I, I'll finish by saying this is the NIH Brain Initiative. DARPA has an equally impressive set of projects that they're undertaking. They're different projects. Those projects are meant to, to, be, to turn into something that can be used in human beings in five years. They want to restore active memory. They want to use deep brain stimulation to treat psychiatric diseases. And there are a number of other things that they're pushing very hard. So we're kind of in the middle, fundamental knowledge and studying humans. DARPA is way out there trying to create innovative treatments that, um, in a contract-based fashion. And on the other side of us is NSF, National Science Foundation, which is doing even more fundamental research than um, we are. So this was a whirlwind tour. Um, if you watch the news, um, watch our web on uh, next week. There will be lots more information. And um, pretty soon, we'll be uh, hopefully seeing um, some of the fruits of this investment. So thank you very much. And I would love to take questions, but I don't have time. Apologize. I have to go, I have to go worry about pain. Thanks. You can feel free to write your questions on the evaluation form, and we'll send them up to Dr. Landis in Maine. I'm sure she'd be glad to answer them. Um, this then concludes the plenary portion of our program, but I want to explain a little bit about what's happening from this point on. First of all, thank you to those of you who joined us this early in the morning and braved the NIH security systems at 8 o'clock. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, so we're going to take a brief break now, which allows you to get that coffee you didn't get and maybe network with some of your colleagues. And at 8.45, we'll reconvene in two breakout sessions. 
the first breakout session we're calling What You, you Need to Know, um, and that is intended for those of you who may want a little bit more information about NIH and how it works. We sometimes refer to this as NIH 101, and that will be led by Vicki Whittemore right here in this room. The second group is for those of you who maybe are looking for answers about the type of research programs that you're running now or hope to run in the future. And that group will be led by Amelie Gubitz over in room F1, F2, which is just down the hallway here to our right. Um, that, meet, that breakout is intended for people who maybe have a research program or are thinking of starting one, but also for some of those of you who have more sophisticated and developed research programs who may be looking for answers about how to meet the future, uh, deal with brain initiative, um, transition any of the programs that you have, add new, new investigators to your group. So both of those groups will run for, from 8.45 until 10 o'clock, and they're meant to be discussion. Our, our program staff will be there to sort of uh, kick off the discussion and give you some thoughts, but we're hoping that these will be more intimate ways that you can learn more about the type of things that we see and, and think we can help you with. At 10 o'clock then, we will go into the meet the direct, uh, program directors portion of the program. And those meetings will be very small and intimate, we hope. Um, we've arranged for the program directors that cover your areas of science to be here to chat with you. Some of them were here all day yesterday and are here in the room right now. Others will be joining us later. Um, you should have received your assignment, your program director, your room, um, at the front registration desk. But if you, if you didn't, just stop in at registration or you can ask me or you can ask Margaret Warren. We all have the lists of, of where you'll be at 10 o'clock. Um, and, and Vicki and Amelie will have a copy as well. And after that, the NINDS portion of the program is completed. Um, what will follow is a session run by your own folks, the people on the executive planning committee with the nonprofit organizations will hold a session back here in this room to talk to you about whatever it is that they wish to talk to you about. And, and the NINDS staff will leave. So I thank you for joining us. I thank you for being here for the, for the day and a half. I hope you've gotten a lot out of the program. And I seriously hope that you'll fill out those evaluation forms because that is the basis for us of next year's meeting. That's where we get our ideas about what it is that you want to hear. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll get started. Um, I'll introduce myself and then really what I want to do is open it up for your questions or comments and Ron, since I know you're a seasoned NIH user, um, I may call on you if I need some additional input. And the other program director we have here in the room um, is Jamie over here from the Office of Clinical Research who is very involved in patient recruitment into clinical trials and clinical studies. So Jamie's here, and I didn't miss anybody else, did I? Maybe some others will wander in. And I also have a piece of paper here in case there are questions, oops, I'm not sure what I just hit, questions you ask me that I can't answer. Um, or the other way to do that would be is if you have a question that I can't answer, put it on your evaluation form and put my name, Vicki, please answer this question, and that will get back to me and I'll get back to you if there's something that I need to do a little research on. So just to tell you who I am, I'm Vicki Whittemore and I'm a program director and I oversee grants primarily on the basic mechanisms of epilepsy and, I, and sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And then sort of oddly enough, I also oversee grants on chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and I, it's an interesting story as to why I have that portfolio. And it's primarily because the patient advocacy groups in that disease area are a challenge. I mean, you can imagine that the disease can be very debilitating for them and they feel, have felt as if there isn't enough research, nobody's listening to them. And so when I came, because of my background, um, which I'll tell you in a minute, 
they thought that I would be the best person to handle this group. Well, I have to tell you, it's been a delight. And I think that's partly because I spent many, many years working in the nonprofit sector. So I was on the faculty and had just gotten tenure at the University of Miami doing research with the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, doing research on spinal cord injury. And my nephew was diagnosed with tuberous sclerosis, which is a rare genetic disorder, when he was three months old. And so I was recruited to serve on the board of directors for the, at that time they were called the National Tuberous Sclerosis Association, and served on the board for, I think, eight or nine years, and then was recruited to the staff to be their first paid scientific director and play, was in that role until about three years ago when I joined NIH. And so I have used NIH from both directions as well. I'm now an employee there um, and have learned a tremendous amount in the three years that I've been there, but also find that almost every day there is something new that you have to address or have to figure out, which is interesting and challenging. Um, but I think from the other perspective, I felt as if we were very effective in how we used NIH. So I'll try to instill some of the, the lessons learned from that as you ask your questions and as we go, go along. So I think I would be open now, I think, to any questions about both how can NIH help you, how can you help NIH, are there things that you, programs you have specific questions about? Um, so the floor is open to any questions or comments you might have. Yes. Hi. I heard <clears throat> lots of things yesterday that were bring to me and having a program director uh, who you would somehow meet with to help understand and navigate. Um, I heard that uh, NIH is really good on convening experts uh, and we had no idea that we're doing it on pennies, uh, piggybacking on another conference, but we need something much bigger and more comprehensive. And Dr. Um, Landis referred to the network uh, of uh, similar research efforts, and I tried to look that up, and it looked like it, I, I couldn't understand what it was, so it's, it's kind of, how do you get a director, how do you um, uh, apply and get funds for convening scientists, and what are the other key tools for a very nascent organization, but one that we see growing and unfortunately growing population? Yeah, yeah, all very good questions. So, um, the, so the best way, if you have no idea, who your program director or the who you should be interacting with at NINDS is to contact Marion Emmers, the Office of Communications. And she will then talk with you, identify who is the most appropriate program director for you to be in contact with. The other way. That would be within the Neurology Institute, within NINDS. And I'll get to broader. You're, I think you're asking a broader question. Um, so the other way to do it is to go on to the NINDS website. And I'm, let me see if I can go on. That would be the most helpful here. How do I shrink this down a bit? There. So this is the NINDS website, and you can see Find People. And if you go down, scroll down, you'll see this is all the list of the sort of more higher up people. But as you, where are the extramural? Here, extramural research program staff. If you click on that, then you'll come up with the list of program directors. So the way our institute is organized is a pretty flat structure. So you'll find in some of the other institutes, it's much more hierarchical. So in other institutes, as a program director, I would report to a branch chief who would report to a division chief who would report to somebody above them before you ever get to the director like Story Landis. 
at NINDS, we don't have that structure at all. So if I have a question, I can go directly to Dr. Landis. Um, and we work in clusters that are uh, um, sort of organized around topic areas. So I'm in the channels, synapses, and circuits cluster. So Brandy Fearman and I handle all of the epilepsy grants, for example. The other three people do pretty much basic neuroscience. But if you scroll down, you can see the other clusters are neural environment cluster. They handle um, stroke, multiple sclerosis, HIV, brain tumor. Um, neurodegeneration cluster handles um, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, all those kinds of disorders. Maybe. ALS. Yes. Click on the, the, the title of the cluster. I think it gives you a brief description ah, of what that, perfect. that cluster works on and focuses on. So Thank you. Know, you don't have to memorize what Vicki's telling you. You can actually go in and see some of what they're working on. Yep. Thank you, Jamie. And so neurogenetics obvious is pretty obvious. Neurogenetic disorders, repair and plasticity is brain injury, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury. Systems and cognitive neuroscience is a lot of, pay, this is where the pain grants are, a lot of cognitive neuroscience and imaging. And then there's the Office of Training, Career Development and Workforce Diversity, which is really where all of our postdoctoral fellowships, clinical fellowship grants, diversity grants, and those sorts of things for trainees is housed. Yes? Uh, it's, you're going down this. I'm noticing we're, we're not in what I would have expected to be in. And, and what, are, what, what rep disease are you? Essential tremor. And, and second of all, I found out yesterday there is one program director in one of these areas working on a project with our condition and then there's another program director working on our condition in some other cluster i'm just at this point i'm confused as okay no I, that's i i understand your question because there is some crossover obviously between the clusters so i think a good example here is Katrina Gwynn, who is really our resident geneticist. And so very often, so for example, we're now out of my cluster funding a huge effort to look at the genetics of epilepsy that's led by people in my cluster, but we pulled Katrina in because of her expertise in genetics. So the other thing I will say to that is that if you contact someone and they turn out not to be exactly the right person, they will know or find out for you who is the right person for you to be talking to. Because it's, it's pretty much the case that one, if not, I mean, in our case, there's two of us in epilepsy, and we, you know, we, we talk to everyone, and if it's more important or more critical for Brandy, my coworker, to be interfacing because of the specific topic area, I'll just tell them you know what, I can help you, but you'd be better off talking to Brandy. Um, and so we're, I think, very good about handing off to, to make sure you're in the right hands. And, and for most diseases, there's one program director that takes the lead. And so, um, you know. Just continue on. Yeah, go ahead. You know, so I've developed a pretty good relationship <coughs> with one of these program directors. Should that be my focus going forward? Yes. Yes, that should be your focus. And as needed, they will pull other people in. If, if needed, or they can pull that other person into a meeting, whoever that other program director is, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to attest to the fact that we fall under epilepsy and autism, which are two different clusters. And it's worked out beautifully. And actually, um, Dr. Whittemore and um, Dr. Malunas have always said who should be handling our questions and it's it's been fantastic so i mean i don't i would not be concerned if you fall under two clusters i mean it's it's been great for us right and so just to kind of explain again a little bit how we work is within nindes and i'll talk about epilepsy because it's what i know best but this happens i think across all the disease areas 
we have an epilepsy working group that brings in people like Dr. Mamuna. So she covers grants that have pri a primary autism focus, but as you can imagine, there are a lot of epilepsy syndromes where autism is a comorbidity. So she comes to those meetings and people from other clusters who have an interest will come. So the, for example, the person that covers grants for traumatic brain injury who has an interest in post-traumatic epilepsy comes to our meetings. And so it's a way where we can all communicate and make sure that we're all on the same page and, and working together. And that happens with Parkinson's and Huntington's and across the board with the diseases. Yeah. How did you get that working group going? Because our illnesses do cover a variety of, of systems. And that's something we need is different specialties. And what is your illness? Dysautonomia. Dysautonomia. And it, it affects different systems. So we need everyone talking to each other. So we're trying to organize that. How did you get that going? So. So the, so, so what I just told you was within NINDS. Right. There also are trans NIH working groups. So um, we have one for epilepsy that's called iCare that also brings in the nonprofit sector to, that, to those discussions. But what you need is a program director to take the lead and identify in the other institutes who are the appropriate program directors. So we did this, and now I'll put on my old nonprofit hat. When I was at the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, we pushed for a trans institute working group because tuberous sclerosis covers multiple organ systems. And so because, and I, and, and, and at NIH, there is typically one institute that takes the lead on your disease. So I would guess that dysautonomia, the lead is in on, is it INDS? Yeah. So what you need to do is work with your program director to identify who are the program directors in the other institutes. So for us, it was multiple institutes. So it was mental health, it was kidney disease, it was a skin institute, uh, I forget all the other, with child health. It was a lot of the other institutes. And so initially, that program director worked with us to identify those people and to organize a meeting. And now they meet on an annual basis. And, and what is really helpful about that is that that helps the program directors to know who in that other institute is taking the lead on these grants when it's a topic area that's of interest to them. So that's one thing. The other way it's helpful is if, say, I want to do a request for applications on dysautonomia, but I don't want it to just be focused on the neurological dis aspects, but I want it to be broader, then I can go to my colleagues in those other institutes and say, listen, I'm putting together this, this initiative, this, that's new, it will be a new call for grants, but I want it to also focus on the other organ systems affected by dysautonomia. Will your institute sign on? And so that, having that working group can really help you a lot. Um, when I was at the TS Alliance, we had an avenue through someone in Congress and actually had that language written into the NIH appropriations. So you often don't have to go that extra mile to get it to happen and you should, my personal opinion is the program director should be working with you, but um, we had that opportunity to say within NIH appropriations that, it, that the NIH director should work with the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke to put in place a trans institute working group on disease X. So that's a way to go and you get attention, but you shouldn't have to do that. So. You know, we made contact with Dr. Gwynn and spoken to her about it, but I didn't know if she's the one or do we have to identify the different people to bring to her, or would she be the one to? She, she can work on that. I mean, it, because I've done that with a couple of different diseases that I have have an interest in. And I mean, people are very open in the other institutes. And you know, if you contact somebody who you 
I contacted someone who I thought was the right person and they said, no, 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 you should be talking to so-and-so. I mean, you know, so people are really good about getting you to the right place. But she should work with you to help yeah, you do that. Yeah. yeah, and you know the the Trans Institute working groups are are I think great because it just helps raise the level of attention and coordination of research across the institutes for your your disease. Yeah. My name is Jim Black, and I'm the medical director of the Cerebral Palsy International Research Foundation based in New York City. And our foundation in the past has primarily been a uh, small grant awarding. Foundation. And we're kind of growing in that sphere, but increasingly, uh, as I heard yesterday, many of the other foundations are getting more involved in facilitation of networks and bringing people together and so forth. So, of course, that kind of activity costs money in terms of personnel support and so forth. So I've been here, uh, this is the third uh, one of these uh, conferences I've been to, and my impression is that other than support of conferences, uh, it's unlikely that there would be uh, NIH support for infrastructure in a foundation to do this sort of background, uh, bringing people together. And so I'm wondering, is that true? Are there, is there a mechanism for that? For, so the foundation would not be doing the research itself. Right. It would be facilitating right. it being done. So is there any way that NIH could support that kind of activity? So this goes back, and I realize I only answered probably one of the questions you raised, but I'll get back to your other questions. Um, so, so let me tackle the conference question because that gets back to one of your questions. Um, so there's two ways that NIH can help with conferences, and I promise to get back to your question. Um, so a group or an investigator or a group of investigators can submit R13, we have codes for all of our grants, but it's called an R13 conference grant, and you can request funds to help you support a conference. Different institutes have different policies about, and for example, I think currently the Mental Health Institute will provide zero funds. Um, child Health, I think, will support conferences, but on a limited budget. We our philosophy has always been that we really understand the importance of bringing people together. And typically, we will support a conference at the level of about $20,000 max. Um, however, if it's a conference that will span other institutes, and we've talked to those institutes ahead of time, what that then would allow me to do is if a grant comes into NINDS and scores well and is approved for funding, then I can go tin cupping to the other institutes and say, okay, we're putting 20,000 in, would you be willing to put in five? And so the best thing, if you're working with someone who's going to be submitting a conference grant, talk to your program director ahead of time. Because, like I said, we typically at NINDS will put $20,000 max in, but if you ask for 30, then I can go tin cupping for the additional 10. So that's, um, and it, you know, I think one on one is easier to answer questions if you have specific things about a conference grant, and I'm happy to do that later. The other way is that if we see as NIH employees, if I see that there's a research area, that really could use convening, bringing people together because the research, typically this happens if the research is just really not coming together. We need to draw attention to the area. We need to bring the researchers together. Then we can propose internally to support a workshop that, and then NINDS Organize, works with an organizing, an external organizing committee, but then we completely support that workshop financially. Bring and bring together those experts to talk together, to plan, bring in the non appropriate nonprofit groups, the other government agencies as appropriate, to really bring the community together. Um, so, in terms of infrastructure grants, there really aren't infrastructure grants per se. The only thing that I can think of 
and this goes actually back to your question about networks, is the rare disease clinical research networks that are funded out of, it's funded out of the Office of Rare Diseases, which is in, now in the NCATS, the National Center for Accelerating Translational Sciences. So about every five years, I believe, they put out a call for applications. And what those grants are meant to do is to bring together a group of rare diseases with similar um, kinds of issues, research questions, into a network that allows then researchers to work with the nonprofit organizations to put in place things like natural history studies, small clinical studies or clinical trials, um, and really can help provide that infrastructure for research. Um, other than that, there, I can't think of other mechanisms. Jamie, can you think of? Thank you. Oh. Go up into the, um, the address bar here. Put your mouse up there. Just right up in there. Yeah. And? Click, click right there. There you go. Okay. I can tell she's much better at this than me. I grew up with Google. This one? Yeah. And now you can see all of the, how they, how they group, begin to start grouping themselves into various consortia based on disease type or attributes of a disease. Have any of you seen this website before? Were you even aware of it? Were you even aware of the very sequence research network? So, um, so you go to each of the very consortiums So yeah. would, would oh. that answer, do you think, be the same if I were asking that of PCORI? PCORI. So no, PCORI is a very different organization. Um, there, and you would have to look at their funding mechanisms. They're a separate organization. They're actually not part of NIH. It's a separate organization. But my understanding there and from the networks that have been funded is that there, those grants are specific to things like funding groups to come together to do a database, a registry. Put, and that funds that um, infrastructure to make that possible. I don't think that, um, I mean, I can't think of any government agency that would provide funding to a nonprofit to help you to then turn around and build your research program. I mean, I, I, Ron, do you have thoughts? I would just make one other suggestion, and that is, you know, we've, we've enjoyed, um, thank you, Jamie, we've enjoyed, I guess, support for four different international conferences, and we uh, made sure as soon as possible that we included government agencies and pharmaceutical industry. Uh, at those conferences, what we've found now is that the pharmaceutical industry is so much interested in those conventions and conferences that they're funding them largely. So our foundation puts in some money. We get some, as, as Vicki said, from various NIH institutes um, because we're, like you, a, a cross-cutting, um, almost trans-institute uh, disease. 
uh, but then the uh, pharmaceutical industry really does pitch in um, and funds uh, a majority of the conferences. So, um, I'm registrar when we have our scientific meeting for the ataxia chapter here, and s numerous times I have had people tell me that they can't come because uh, their daughter who takes care of them couldn't, was too tired then on a Saturday to take them to the conference. And this raises t for me one issue that, and s that is really worrisome to me, and this is number one, it, other than that, we've heard this before, the people just being so isolated, when, particularly with rare diseases. The other thing is the caregivers themselves are just exhausted. And this is just, um, and I'm wondering, is there any way to give help, um, you know, to provide so they could come? You know, it, you know I, maybe it's taxis, whatever, pay somebody to come to a one-day conference. Is there any f mechanism for that? I, I hate to, I know it's really specific, but it's so really. So there, I can't. I don't think that NIH could support that. However, I will say that many of our conferences are now webcast, and we have the ability within NIH to have a conference webcast live. So, and people can type in questions from home. Um, this has been really successful for the chronic fatigue syndrome community who really, you know, if they come to a conference, they crash and they're crash and burn and they're done. So this has allowed them to participate in conferences in ways they've never been able to before. Um, it doesn't answer the question or help with providing that person the ability to come and interact with people. Um, and you know, I think we've always turned to the nonprofits to sort of help with that kind of support. But you know, I mean, and that may be possible. If NIH is helping to support the conference, that frees up some of your funds that could go to help support some of these people to come to a conference. Jamie, do you have a comment? I was just going to say that would be actually one thing to put, if you were going to do an R13 grant application, is, is to indicate we're going to use NIH or NINDS support for this to bring in our speakers to pay for the facilities and things so that we can then put in, or well, you know what I mean, to pay for them to travel in or things like that, but then um, to be able to use our own funds to bring in members of the community living with this disease to be part of the conference. So you could indicate in your grant application how you're going to try to match or allocate funds from your own resources versus what you would use NINDS funds for, and I think that would um, help drive home the point that trying to make, which is that we've got to provide support for people coming in to participate in this process. And I think it goes not just to, to conferences, but also to clinical research in general, right? Whether we're doing studies or, um, or you know, trials or, or longitudinal um, yeah. studies and things. How do we get research to the people where they are? And how do we ensure that, that um, we're, we're getting the broadest possible sampling of those people, considering the amount of isolation that you mentioned? And so those are things that we, we expect and ask for now investigators to budget for them in their studies, in their study budgets when they submit a grant, because we know that those are issues. How do you address the, the caregiver issue? How, we, we, yes, we do. We do. Now, that doesn't, that's not to say that the budgets won't get cut. <laughs> but what we do is we say, you make the cut. Here's the amount that you need to cut. You decide how you're going to allocate those cuts across your budget. So that's, I mean, that's just the reality of NIH funding nowadays. But yes, we do ask, because that's a recruitment and retention issue. And if you have a study that you, you know, that we think is important enough to fund, but you can't recruit anybody to it because of those very simple logistical issues, then we're just wasting money, right? We're just pouring money into a big hole in the water and um, hoping that at some point somebody plugs the leak. That's not what we want to do. So I, you know, I think that, if you're working with investigators who are building a study for you, you know, and you're working with them from design question forward, you know, designing the question forward, talk to them about those issues with logistics. How do we get the, piece, the research to the people where they are, or how do we make it as easy as possible for them to get to where we are? And talk to them, make sure you bring those issues up and that you ask them, are they budgeting for it? Are they resourcing for it appropriately? Other questions? Other questions? Yeah. 
Um, I'm a Parkinson's disease research advocate, and I, um, I live in DC, just down the road, and I um, applied to do um, Parkinson's clinical studies and observational studies, and I came for a, a full-day evaluation by Dr. Lungu, and I did one observational study, and I assumed, what I understood was that I was going to be in a database and that I would be called for other studies for which I was appropriate as they arose, but I haven't heard another word since. And I know that there have been other studies that I would be suitable for, so I was just wondering whether I was mistaken or whether I really am in a database. I think that's a really good question, and I, it's my understanding, and I work on the extramural side, so I don't necessarily know all of the inner workings of the intramural side, but it is my understanding that they do have a database of research volunteers. Um, I want to point you in the direction of another database of research volunteers called Research Match. Have you heard of it? So Research Match, and just, yeah, just type in researchmatch.org in the URL there. So Research Match is um, run out of Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, sorry, um, Vanderbilt University, and this is, um, they're also now doing sub-registries for a lot of rare diseases. I think they even have a POTS sub-registry in here. Right, so they're, 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 you can go in here and you can sign up and build your profile. Um, it's a little bit like the FOX trial finder, which is very specific to Parkinson's disease. This allows you to build a profile based on all sorts of different disease conditions or m drugs you may take. I'm a healthy volunteer in here, and I get emails from this thing all the time to participate in survey research and MRI screenings over here at the clinical center. And so I come over here all the time and, and participate because I firmly believe in putting my money where my mouth is. If I'm asking you guys to participate, I ought to be doing the same thing. But um, they're also now building in these sub-registries for lots of different rare diseases. So I encourage you, if you're not already um, signed up and participating in Research Match, at least go and look at the website and see if it might be appropriate to get in touch with them about building a, a sub-registry for your particular disease type, okay? Um, and then in terms of the, the NIH database, the intramural database, what we probably need to do is put you in touch with a patient representative public liaison, the PURPLE group, PRPL. Um, on the intramural side, and I can help you um, navigate finding them and asking them about their, their database of research volunteers and whether or not they're still utilizing that and how they're utilizing it, because I think it's a very valid point that you bring up. I signed up, I agreed to participate, and nobody's calling me. Why? Yeah, it's just that if I'm not being called, then other, other people Right, exactly. And the other thing I wanted to bring up, too, is those of you that have registries for your disease type, um, if you go to the NIH homepage, we have um, just NIH.gov. Yep. Yeah. We have um, uh, just a little bit below the fold, so you have to kind of scroll down a little bit. We have a website called Clinical Trials and You. If you scroll down just a hair, there you go, Clinical Trials and You. And we have a listing of registries. So on the left hand side there, the third link down. So, um, if you have a registry that's not included here that you think that we should include, um, you can get in touch with me. I'm on the, the Trans-NIH Working Group that monitors and maintains this particular page, and um, I would be more than happy to work with you through the process of getting your registry linked onto this page. I'm learning something new here, too. This is cool. Yeah. I didn't know about this. Um, so, clinical trials and you, I've been here at NIH for a little over three and a half years, and um, I think this has been up for maybe five years, and it's been growing. And so, the last three and a half years, I've been working on this, and the, the list of registries is probably something we've um, been growing over the last year, year and a half, if I recall. So, but yeah, we need to do a better job of making sure people know it's out there, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if you, if you just click on one of those, so for instance, click on the Global Rare Diseases Patient. Um, there you go. So this takes you to, this is an NIH-sponsored um, registry here in the Office of Rare Disease um, at NCAT. So we probably need to figure out why and see what we can do to get Huntington's listed, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
If you can't hear what she's saying, she's saying That's Huntington's right. isn't here and it's been supported since. We were the very first registry we supported in 1979. It was the first recommendation of our commission to NINDS, which you funded. And now you just jump, stopped funding it. So now the Hereditary Disease Foundation funding it. Other questions? One of the challenges that I've had trying to navigate all of these is having a disease that just has a gene locator name. So it's so, it, there's no name yet. Uh, so on the NINS thing, I never have a place to look. And then here, there's nothing so it's, it's this nascent stage where they, they know this gene has um, catastrophic developmental and seizure impacts, but they don't know how it works. It doesn't have a name other than the gene the identifier. Gene so do we need to accelerate getting it a name so it is something? Uh, or are there case histories where there are similar things. I mean, we heard yesterday, you know, genes being identified 10, 15 years ago. When you, you've got the gene identified, but you don't know hardly anything about how it works. Um, so it's like we're lost between all the categories here. Right. So it's interesting because I think historically many of the at least neurological diseases, were named after the person who identified the disease. So Friedrich's ataxia, tuberous sclerosis was originally called Bourneville's disease. Um, so you raise a very interesting problem or dilemma. Um, I know that some of the groups that are out there now are really just going by their gene name, but I'm not sure that that, I don't know, it'd be interesting for groups to comment on whether that's helpful or not. I, I, I've thought a lot about names because our name keeps changing, <laughs> which is difficult. Um, but I, my understanding is if there's oh. an entry in gene reviews, oh. that that tends to be the name that people use. I'm that's been my there. experience. Hold on, I'm trying to get there. I should get it's Jamie up here. Uh, here, maybe okay. somebody else. Can yeah. I don't know. I've never heard of gene reviews. So gene reviews, I'm familiar with, is um, it was actually funded, I believe, by the National Library of Medicine originally, and what it was is a listing of information about a particular gene and that genetic disorder that was caused by that gene that gave you some basic information about the clinical aspects of the disease, what research was going on, where you could go for testing for that particular genetic disease. Um, is, this, is this it? What we're, is yep, this, what we're this is it. Okay. And so I'm not sure who's funding it now, but I know that it's continuing. And they call on experts in that particular genetic disease to help them write these entries. Um, go to SCN 8A. This is, oh, wait, okay. this is the test. SCN 8A, 9A, 1A. That's. Oh, it's not, okay. It this is the test. Okay. But you're in the gene test part of it. Okay, I went here, but this was, this looks like it's an article. Yeah. Or a, yeah, that's a review of review. what it is. Uh, is the APC, that's a gene, okay. So is gene reviews part of gene tests? Gene tests is part of gene reviews. Go to home. So oh, really? So scroll down. Go. There's a Wikipedia. <laughs> and it'll, it'll give us a link, right? I'm sorry. Was funding from Official the official website right there. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Well, so that's the official website. Gene reviews by title. Oh, okay. Here we go. So you said we're looking for what? SCN 8A. 
It's not even listed there yet. It's not listed there yet. I can work with you on that. We'll talk. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested in other people's comments about organization names. Um, I think it can make a difference. So like I said, for a long time, the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, which is their name now, was called the National Tuberous Sclerosis Association. And then, I mean, that was fine until we became international, so national no longer fit, and before the days of Google searches, because when you did a search on tuberous sclerosis, National Tuberous Sclerosis Association didn't come up. I mean, it was, I mean, it would come up, but it wouldn't be at the top of the list. So there's lots of these kinds of things you need to think about that I'm not the expert on, but um, I think putting you in touch with some people who think, Rob Moss, who was here yesterday, um, is really very smart about these kinds of things. He is the founder of Seizure Tracker. Um, but has understands all this kind of stuff. Somebody over here had a comment. Yeah, in the blue shirt. I'm sorry. Yeah. We've had a, a big, big problem because we're the opposite of a rare disease, and you know affects about 10 million people. Yet practically nobody knows it, and it was because of the name. Uh, it was called the shakes. It was called tremor. It's called benign tremor, familial tremor, it just, it just went down the list. And all it did was cause lots and lots of confusion. Hopefully we've come up with one name for it. And um, it, it, it's just very, very frustrating, you know, to have such a lack of awareness because yeah. of all this confusion. And what is the name that you're using now? Uh, essential tremor. Essential tremor. Which covers familial and? Yes. So it's the umbrella for? Yes. All of tremor. Yes. But I mean, back in you know the, the early 1900s, they just called it the shakes. Yeah. You know, they called, they had all sorts of names for this thing. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, I can just tell you that it gets confusing and it's not perfect. And as the science and the technology gets better, it gets more confusing. So. Um, when we were identified by a cytogeneticist 15 years ago, it was called what it was, which is what the scientists to the community wanted to do, get away from the name of the scientist or the investigator and go to the gene. So we were 22Q13 uh, deletion syndrome. And then a few years, it rolls right off your tongue. So a few years later, um, because we were in the 22nd chromosome and the Q area and the 1-3, and 22Q11 was a set of other syndromes, de George and others. And then there was discoveries of deletions that didn't have the phenotype or the characteristics, so then it needed a name. And the parents insisted on naming it after the people that had done the most research, Phelan and McDermott. So we have this name, Phelan McDermott syndrome. Nobody put the initials together and found out that it was PMS. So <laughs> we've made lemonade out of lemons and we're the PMS. Um, yeah. So, um, so, but within um, this, we now have gone from focusing on a chromosome and a deletion to mutations to genes. And so then you're talking about a Shank 3 gene. But what about the people that have other genes? And as technology gets better and the um, genetic testing gets more granular, it's going to change. And what seemed like a rare um, situation as as genetic testing gets cheaper, um, it will become a larger um, uh, syndrome. And then it might split up into different kinds. Well, well, these kids are high functioning and these kids are low functioning or these kids have um, epilepsy and these kids don't. So it gets sliced and diced. And so I don't have the answer for you, but it's not as simple as coming out with a good marketing name. You have to really think it through. Um, can it be pronounced? I mean, I, there are people in this room that I have been doing advocacy with for years, and I know the initials of their disease, but I could not pronounce it to you to save my life. Mm -hmm. um, so think it through and ask a lot of people in this space about it, um, and do a lot of internet research in terms of what else might have those names. The other disease, DeGeorge, 22Q11, um, redid their website a couple years ago, and they decided to streamline things, and they're 22Q.org. Well, we're 22Q13.org, 
And we've had patients misdiagnosed into a completely different place. They were in the wrong Facebook for years. Their geneticists didn't know the difference. People were giving money to a different foundation. They were going to the wrong meetings. So um, you really kind of have to know your space. And it's not, don't, don't rush out and name yourself and um, ask the stakeholders. Um, I mean, even our gene in Europe, it's called ProSAP2. And in the United States, it's called Shank3. So, um, Think, try and think in the future about what can happen in terms of technology. Right. Um, so is scn 8 I should know this, is it similar to Dravet syndrome, which is SCN1A? Yeah. yeah this is it's a part of the spectrum. Right. Sodium channel. Sodium channel. Yeah, yeah. Can I talk now? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Richard Zion with uh, Cure PSP. We deal with a whole range of neurodegenerative brain disorders, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, multiple system atrophy, ALS, PDC. And the whole issue of names is, is impossible. It's, it's just really mind blowing. So um, I would recommend that you, you work with a, if you can afford it, or find some way to work with uh, marketing and PR folks. Uh, to help you brand yourself. It, it will really help for you to get your message out because all of these names and numbers don't mean a thing except to, to you folks. And yeah. if you do want to raise money uh, beyond your constituents, you're going to have to consider uh, how you present yourself to the general public. So we've done that right now. And we're trying to we're looking at our disorders, which are apart from Alzheimer's, apart from Parkinson's, but very similar as prime of life disorders, which strike uh, brain disorders, which strike people between 40 and 80 years old. So we've also uh, redefined prime of life, not to people who are in their 30s, but people who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, because, you know, 60 is the new 40, et cetera, sure. et cetera. So, um, uh, that's one way to, um, you know, to help you get, you, you know, to clarify your message and your brand. Sometimes a way to handle that if you don't have money to go out and get a PR firm is to find someone on a PR firm that will serve on your board of directors. I think that's one um, tactic. I also think another, I think this is an incredibly important point, the, the branding and marketing of, of your disease and your organization, right? But I think um, another option is to also contact your local school of public health, because a lot of them now have um, programs in marketing and communication for public health issues. And so you might be able to tap into the creative and innovative ideas of um, graduate students in public health who are working on how do we market public health issues? And how do we um, promote those in ways that are uh, meaningful and relevant to the appropriate constituencies? So I, that's one way that you might be able to get some free services as well. And I just wanted to add, um, when, when our group was, was first uh, identified, it was called von Recklinghaus disease. And then it was called neurofibromatosis. Then we found out we had neurofibromatosis type 1, type 2. Now we have schwannomatosis and legis. And we actually have stayed with the word neurofibromatosis, even though now we, as science has advanced, we have all these other categories. And I'm sure there's going to be more as science continues to advance. But there's been a real benefit in keeping us all collectively together. I mean, neurofibromatosis type 1 and type 2 are in two different chromosomes. But still, for advocates doing advocacy work, there has been a real benefit for us being together, although our meetings have to be broken out now into NF1, NF2, schwannomatosis, and legis, different functions. Still, because we are a rare disorder, there is a, a strong benefit in keeping us together. I would think in terms of community building as well. So even though your diseases have different locales, there should be a lot that's in common amongst your constituents, right? And so bringing them together for meetings allows them to network with one another and also provide the instrumental support and the social support that everybody needs while then addressing the breakout sessions of the various different diseases. That's absolutely true. The other thing I'll comment on is that many disease entities also have consortium where you can come together. So for example, for the epilepsies, 
there's what's called Vision 2020 that is organized together with the American Epilepsy Society. Eileen is the executive director in the back there, um, which is, it started out as being the Epilepsy Foundation meeting with, um, with the board of directors of the American Epilepsy Society, which is the professional organization, clinicians and researchers, and now has grown into, I don't know how many groups, 35 groups that come together and work together, and it's been amazing. And uh, there's the Parkinson's Action Network. Some of you could probably also tell, tell us about other kind of consortia that have come together to work together that way. And it has, I think, really benefited. It benefits everyone. It benefits especially the rare disease groups within that consortia, but I think it also expands the um, the reach of the bigger groups like the Epilepsy Foundation and the other research group in the epilepsy space, which is CURE, Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy. So I think that's another thing to think about is and look around or talk to your program director. Is there something like that that you could be part of with your disease group? Other questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Um, running shoes today. Sorry. Yeah. I kind of know the answer to this question, but I am, um, I know enough to be dangerous and not enough to be helpful, so I'm just going to ask this. So what I've learned in the last four years are the NIH is 27 institutions? 27 institutes and centers. Okay. And the Office of Rare Disease is now under NCATS, which is the newest institution. But if we learn everything there is to know about NINDS and how your grants work and, and your rules and policies, have we learned everything we know, need to know about the other 26 organizations? Or do each institution kind of run their own way and, and, and work slightly differently and you kind of have to orient yourself with each institution that you fall under. And I think we fall under about four. Um, the one I had the most question about that we don't do much with is the genetics institution. Right. The excellent question. So um, if you go on to the NIH website and click on institutes at NIH, you get this list over here of the abbreviations of all of the institutes and centers. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the different institutes and centers, centers operate differently. And that's part of, I think, it's a, sometimes a good thing, bad thing. But it's a bad thing for you because you do have to learn how each institute functions. And like I said, they're, when I started, they're set up in very different structures. Um, so like I said, NINDS has a very flat structure, whereas others are much more hierarchical, where you have a program director who reports up the chain. Um, and so you just really, you start, I, you start at each institute with the appropriate program director. But as I also told you, every disease really has a home at NIH. It's so a lead institute. And so you really should start at that lead institute. So for any neurological disorder, NINDS will be your lead institute. And then the other institutes may also fund research on your disease re relevant to their mission. Um, but there's one institute that will always take the lead on that disease. Um, in terms of funding grants, Across NIH, there are, if you go back here, go back up here to grants and funding, and go down here to types of grant programs, you'll see the whole list of all the different kinds of grants that are funded across NIH. So the sort of standard grant for most investigators, most investigator-initiated research is what's called an R01, a research project grant program. And I, would, I don't think there's any institute that does not fund R01s. However, there are other smaller grant programs like the R03 and the R21 that some institutes don't fund those grants. And so you do have to kind of identify 
within an institute what kind of, if you're looking for grant funds or helping investigators to really understand which institutes fund those types of grants and which don't. In terms of decision making around grant funding, there, this is handled differently between different institutes as well. So for example, at NINDS, we set, we, Dr. Landis, sets a pay line, which means that when grants get scored, they get scored from the best, which is in the first percentile, to however high they go in the 60th percentile amongst the grants that get discussed. And then in every grant review session, there are grants in that study section that score poorly on preliminary scoring, so they're not even discussed. But within those that get discussed, from the, the best, like I said, is, will be scored in the first, what's called the first percentile. And then in our institute currently, we funded through the 14th percentile. So that means that any grant that through review scored between the first and the 14th percentile automatically got funded. In other institutes, they don't set a pay line because they want to pick and choose the grants that are of highest priority to them. So if I may submit a grant to a different institute that scores in the fifth percentile that at NINDS would be an automatic fund that now in this institute isn't funded because they decided that my topic isn't of a priority to them, even though the reviewer said my application was very good. So I think again, you have all the different institutes do function a little differently and, and some of that is based on their culture, the disease areas they cover and others it's you know a culture that has been built or developed by the institute director and the council that advises them. So I think you just, in answer to your question, um, you do have to work with each institute and sort of figure out the landscape. But again, your program director at NINDS can really help to guide you and help you to know sort of how, if, if there are significant differences between institutes. Couple comments, yeah. One, I just want to add one thing about this and you, is that one of the ways that the nonprofits who do fund can really help researchers is taking a look at researchers, particularly the younger and newer ones, giving them their first grant because they build a reputation. And then, because it's so competitive, then they maybe have a shot, and a lot of them do, to go on to further funding. Now, I may be talking to the choir here, but for those of you in the new business, that, that is terribly important. If we do nothing else, we do that. That's, that's a very good comment. So providing enough funding for a young investigator to get some, a seed grant to get some preliminary data that they can then use in their application to NIH is really, really helpful. Um, again, how institutes function differently. So at NINDS, a new investigator, well across NIH, an early stage investigator is defined as someone who is within 10 years of their terminal degree. And so in a grant review session, those grants are reviewed separate from the grants that are being submitted by more seasoned senior investigators. So there's, they're reviewed with the understanding that these are new young investigators. Then when they come to the institute to be discussed for funding, again, at NINDS, we apply the same rule. If it's scored in the 14th percentile or better, automatically funded. If it scores between the 14th and the 25th percentile, Dr. Landis takes a look at every one of those grants and says, is this a new investigator that could use this bump? Is, you know, what were the concerns in review? If they're minor, fund it. And so we give a bump at NINDS to those early stage investigators so that they're funded within that range above the 14th percentile. There's also a term called new investigator, which is a person who is typically outside that 10 years since their terminal degree, so they're a little bit more senior, but it's a person who has never had an NIH grant. 
So they also get put into this category and looked at be above the 14th percentile and de determined whether funding will be recommended or not. Typically, those kinds of investigators, I've got a couple of them in my grant portfolio, and they're typically people who say after a postdoc went and worked in a pharmaceutical or biotech company for a while, and now they're back in academia. And so they, you know, many of them, it's their first NIH grant, they're, they really need that to get started and their lab launched, but there's, that's a different category than the early stage investigator. And so I think, again, I don't know how other institutes handle the ESIs. I would, any of the other program, there's a bunch of program directors here now. Does anybody know how the others, you just have to, I think, to find out at the other institutes. Just to reinforce that excellent point, um, one case study would be our first grant, our foundation's first grant was only $28,000. It was a seed grant to a young investigator. Um, he used that, we split that grant with a patient family. 14,000 from our foundation, 14,000 from the family. Went to that young investigator who uh, used it to assemble his preliminary data, used it for his first application for R01 and got the R01. Uh, he's now a uh, department chair at a major university and serves on our board of directors. So, pretty cool. Um, Very cool. But Vicki, isn't um, another common piece of common ground among the, the various institutes that they all have or most of them have a National Advisory Council. Right. And wouldn't that be a great way for our advocates to learn about each of these? So. Excellent point. So yes, each, each institute has, and I think the offices as well, because I do work with the Office of Research of Women's Health, and they have an advisory council. So the advisory council are individuals that are appointed to a four-year term and come into NIND or into NIH to the institute for three meetings a year typically and provide recommendations to the director. And so there's an always an open part, an open session to those council meetings and a closed session. So we just had our meeting um, most recent one in September. So anyone is welcome to attend the open session. And actually, those are now also webcast, so you don't have to physically attend. But I think it's also important if you want to sort of build relationships with people within the institute to come and attend those meetings, talk to program directors, learn how that institute operates and functions, how they think. And I can think that can be really helpful. That's, thank you, that's a very good point. Um, but if you go on every institute's website, you can find out when they're, I can go to NINDS and show you. I just wanted to add, um, at Cure PSP, we have an investigator initiated research program where young investigators come to us with their projects. And usually these, are, these projects are $50,000, $100,000. And very frequently, after they have been awarded a grant at Cure PSP, they will apply to NIH for an R01 and, uh, and, and get a grant, which is very good. We really encourage young scientists to get into neuro research. It's very, very difficult, as you know, for Young, young scientists to, to get established, especially in neurology and neuro research, because there isn't all that money out there. The pharmaceutical companies aren't really all that interested in, in funding, uh, you know, drug development, that sort of thing. So we, at, at the advocate patient support level, have to really be advocates for these new researchers. We have to provide those opportunities for them. When, when they have these meetings here, if these people are here, you can ask them maybe to stay a night and then address your folks, you know? So you, you kind of piggyback on the fact that the government has kind of paid for them to get there and then, you know, have them for dinner, you know, do something like that. Uh, it, it really, it has helped us enormously, so. 
Okay, we're running up on 10 o'clock, so last question over there. Oh, I'm this sorry. Just a, a comment. Yeah. I think the very first grant we ever gave was to David Hausman to find the marker in 83, and then the collaboration of 150 people uh, to collaborate without any um, authorship. They all agreed to work on it as a group uh, to find the gene. And we've been funding research ever since. I think it's a critical role. And you really find that people um, are uh, shockingly enthusiastic about curing these difficult diseases. But you have to also be enthusiastic and supportive of their lives, their agonies, their academic down. careers, yeah, exactly. yes, absolutely. No, I, that's an excellent point. And I remember back in the days when we were, I was at the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance and we were looking for the gene or genes that cause that disease. We would organize a workshop at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting to bring all the groups from around the world together to provide their, present their results to each other and we bought coffee. You know, that's really all that was in it for us. And they came, we were the conveners. Um, and so I think, you know, and it, eventually we were giving $10,000 to each of these labs to pay for part of a postdoc to work on our project. So, yeah, <laughs> that would be a good, there was one last question over there and then I think we'll have to right. wrap so up. Half of the uh, title of this session was how can the NIH help nonprofits? So I was wondering how, First, are the program directors with these nonprofits so that if a grant comes in and you can see this foundation could be helpful in recruitment or, you know, if it's a, on the genetics of cerebral palsy, to know that our foundation might have a network uh, that is looking at that sort of issue. So uh, when you see these coming in, is it possible for the program directors to refer applicants to foundations to be collaborative with them? I'll let Jamie take that one. Yeah, I'll actually um, answer that. We, so in the Neuronext network, which is the phase two um, neurological studies clinical research network, we actually require that all protocol working groups, so when a protocol comes through um, to apply for funding, that they have an advocacy member from the appropriate advocacy constituency on the protocol working group designing the question, designing the protocol, designing the outcome measures, and designing the communication plan. So we require that. Other studies, we now strongly encourage it. So, and um, if a study comes in, so for instance, recently we had an, uh, an applicant come in for their 01 and got their summary statement back and there were some concerns that they needed to address in terms of recruitment and, and things that had been brought up. And so they called me on the phone and they said, what can we do to make sure that when we go back in with our A1 that we have addressed all these concerns and what does NINDS recommend? And one of the first questions I asked was, are you working with advocacy? So we are, constantly promoting this issue because of this, the, the whole new movement in patient-centered research, right? It's not just at PCORI. We actually think that it's very important here that we start doing patient-centered research that includes your voices so that we're designing research that's relevant to you and resonant with you and your providers because that's the only way that we're going to be able to recruit these studies that we're spending millions of dollars on. So that's, that's a big issue, getting Exactly. Does that, did that answer your question? Okay, well, we have to wrap up. Um, if there are questions you have that didn't get answered, come see me and I can help you find out how to get that question answered. Um, and now we're moving into the breakout sessions and meet with your program directors. I wasn't given a list of where the rooms are. So if you have a question as to who you're meeting with and in what room, I would suggest go back out to the registration desk. I know the epilepsy groups are meeting in room D. Um, and last announcement, someone lost, did, if anyone lost a cell phone, it's at, it's at the registration desk. Thank you all. <laughs>